بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد محمد وعلى أله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله I first of all this is we're all back we haven't been this is really our first uh, lecture since the COVID started so we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Thomas Hibbs here and I first met Dr. Hibbs in at Baylor uh, University where we actually had a program that was done there and they really honored me. Uh, I was there as a, um, a lecturer for an endowed lecture series that they have. So uh, we actually had a conversation as opposed to a lecture with Dr. George. But I, in coming to know Dr. Hibbs through his work and, and also through interacting with him, I have to say there, there aren't, I don't think personally there aren't a lot of people left in our culture that do certain things that are very important. And one of them is deep philosophy. There's still philosophy programs in the United States, but a lot of these philosophy programs have really been removed from philosophia, this idea of the love of wisdom. Uh, in fact, uh, one Muslim philosopher said it really should be called misosophy, which is the hatred of wisdom, because a lot of what happens there, traditionally philosophers were in pursuit of the truth. Uh, now a lot of it is actually about deconstructing what people perceive to be the truth uh, in order to kind of uh, unsettle them in their beings. Uh, and all of our religious traditions are really there to help us settle into our being. Uh, and, and so I just, I'm very, very honored to have him here with us. He works in the area of medieval philosophy, which is an extremely important area. It's, uh, it's a neglected area of research. People that tend to go into it uh, find themselves uh, uh, in, incapable of getting out of it. Uh, and that's, that happens with a lot of people. So he uh, works especially around St. Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval philosopher of the, uh, of the Catholic tradition. He works in contemporary virtue ethics and has a wonderful book on virtue ethics and also on aesthetics, which traditionally was extremely important branch of philosophy. So he is currently the J. Newton uh, Razor Senior Pres Professor of Philosophy at Baylor University, where he's also Dean Emeritus, having served 16 years as Dean of the Honors College and Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Culture. He has a PhD from the University of Notre Dame and served as tutor at St. Thomas Aquinas College, which in some ways I certainly has a correlation to what we're doing here. It's a Catholic college, small college in Southern California, and we've actually really, when we were formulating a lot of the things here at Zaytuna, they were one of the model colleges that we really looked at to see how they were doing things. So, um, and also uh, full professor and department chair of philosophy at Boston College. And, the, and then he was president of the University of Dallas, which I also was invited there and participated in a wonderful trilogue between the Jewish, um, uh, Catholic, and Muslim uh, view on education. Uh, he's published over 30 scholarly articles and has seven books, and the most recent of which, which I would really encourage for m more advanced students uh, that are interested in philosophy, on wagering uh, on an ironic God, Pascal, uh, on philosophy and faith, which uh, Baylor University Press published, and he's currently working on a book on Catholic aesthetics. He's published more than 100 reviews, discussion articles on film, theater, art, and higher education in a variety of venues, including First Things, the Dallas Morning News. He actually wrote a beautiful op-ed on what we're doing here on Zaytuna College. Uh, and so we're honored to have a, a friend like that for us, um, and uh, the National Review and others. He also has two books on film and philosophy. One of them shows... Uh, uh, sh Shows about nothing, yeah. So, which is a very interesting take on the nihilism embedded in a lot of our popular culture. 
um, great philosopher said, if you give me the stories that you tell the people, I'll determine your culture. So it's no wonder that we have so much despair out there when so much of the, uh, the culture is nihilistic. And he's also served as president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association. So his, interestingly enough, his, his lectures have been, I mean, we're in Berkeley and maybe if they knew he was here, there might be some people that would have protested uh, coming here. But his, uh, he has been protested by nihilists of all people, um, which is kind of ironic because if you believe in nothing, then nothing should really matter. But uh, having said that, we believe in something, and something does matter, and one of them is the topic that Dr. Hibbs is going to address us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for this invitation. It's really wonderful to be with you, wonderful to experience the hospitality of Setuna, and you students are really blessed with your faculty. I got to spend some time with them at lunch, and uh, brilliant uh, and devoted to the life of the mind and to s teaching and to students. I want to talk a little bit. Uh, I don't have a written paper. I'm going to read some some uh, quotes from uh, an essay by George Orwell and talk a little bit about liberal education and uh, why it's important, why we need it, why everyone needs it, and why we need it particularly today. Seventy-five years ago, Orwell wrote an essay called Politics in the English Language. This is a year after Animal Farm and just a few years before 1984, before he would publish those books. And he says this, most people who bother with the matter at all would admit that the English language is in a bad way. This is the mid-1940s. He's saying that the English language was in a bad way. He didn't live to see Twitter uh, or uh, political debates where we can't today in America even seem to muster memorable sound bites, let alone anything like the, the eloquence of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, or even the public speeches in the late 60s of Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King. We can't come close to the eloquence of, uh, of politics uh, of just a few decades ago. Orwell says this, the decline of a language must ultimately have political and economic causes. It is not due simply to the bad influence of this or that individual writer. If you know anything about Orwell and his own writings and the, uh, the language that we've developed out of him, Big Brother, Newspeak, Thought Police, Thought Crime, Group Think, you won't be surprised that Orwell thinks there's an important connection between politics and language. And there are dangerous ways in which politics can use language and we can become its victims. What Orwell focuses on in this short essay, though, is one small but for each of us individually potentially liberating way of trying to make sure that we don't render ourselves vulnerable to political totalitarianism and to control by language that's crafted by someone else. And he focuses upon writing, especially in this essay. And he says at one point that our language becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness, there's a word you don't hear much anymore, slovenliness of our language, the sloppiness and laziness of our language, makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. So a decline in our language ultimately has political causes. It's not just one or another of us writing badly or speaking badly. But it's rooted in this kind of reciprocal relationship between thought and language where thought becomes lazy, language becomes sloppy. That makes thought become lazier. Orwell offers, it's not a great essay for teaching you how to write. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that Real writing is, is rewriting. Real writing, especially for those of you who are undergraduates, is a matter of learning to do to your own essays, hopefully before, before you turn them in, uh, what your teacher will do to them after he or she gets them, which is to criticize them. Becoming a good writer is being able to write a draft and set it aside 
and come back a few hours or a day later and say, you know what, some of this is pretty good, but a lot of it's got to go. A lot of it, and we all think when we're writing something and we finish the first draft, it's brilliant, right? I said it, it's got to be brilliant. And becoming a good writer is being able to inflict some pain upon yourself as a writer and learning how to do that with certain kinds of habits. One of the things that Orwell says I think is really helpful. He says, a scrupulous writer in every sentence he writes will ask himself at least four questions. What am I trying to say? What words will express it? What image or idiom will make it clearer? Is this image fresh enough to have an effect? What Orwell is advocating here is for us to take self-conscious ownership of our own language so that we don't just, in a sloppy or slovenly way, repeat things that we've never thought clearly about. So if we become intellectually lazy and our language becomes vague and sloppy, Orwell thinks we're more likely to be vulnerable to people who want to use language to manipulate us, whether that's government officials or the advertising industry or one or another ideological movement that might attempt to co-opt our thinking for us. He says that the problem here and the result of not being careful about our language The result is not just bad writing. It's not just that you don't get a good grade that you'd like to have in a writing class. right? If you don't take self-conscious ownership of your language and your thought, Orwell says this, you're not obliged to go to all this trouble. It's a free country, you could hear Orwell saying, right? You don't have to go to all this trouble. You can shirk it by simply throwing your mind open and letting the ready-made phrases come crowding in, the cliches. And and think about those words I mentioned earlier that we've gotten from Orwell, newspeak, et cetera. Those have become cliches. So this is a great irony about Orwell in our current culture. The, The language that Orwell uses has become cliches that we don't think carefully about. These ready-made phrases will construct your sentences for you. Right, we've all done this. You sit down, you got to get an assignment done, you just start writing. They will not only construct your sentences for you, they will even think your thoughts for you. And at need, they will perform the important service of partially concealing your meaning even from yourself. So if you're not careful about your thinking and your language, you won't even really know what you're saying. And he says, it is at this point that the special connection between politics and the debasement of language becomes clear. What those who would manipulate us through controlling our language want is for us to be passive channelers of the cliches and not to think about the implications of the language or the pre suppositions of the language. We are deeply afflicted by groupthink, by bad, really toxic tribalism in our culture. You just have to open up Twitter, and it doesn't matter what the first tweet is about. Within three subtweets, people are going to be arguing ideologically and, uh, and assuming the default position in these encounters is that the people who disagree with us are both stupid and evil. That's the default position. The surveys are actually pretty amazing. I mean, John Haidt, whom we've done events with, who writes as a social psychologist, I recall during the Kavanaugh hearings, those the awful public acrimony, he tweeted something about a survey tracing Uh, asking Americans the question, do you hate members of the other political party? From the 80s up through almost the the first decade of our century, this hovered at around 15%, up about almost 50% of Americans said 
that they hate members of the other political party. It's also interesting and ironic and not healthy for us that the people uh, in a particular party, those people in a particular party who get their judgments wrong about the other political party, about what those people think and do, are the people who are most politically actively engaged. It's the people, the sort of the people who are not that actively engaged, who actually have a kind of moderate view of people in the other political party. So, you know, what the founders, the Federalist Papers wanted, was an active and informed citizenry. We're in a weird situation where, in some sense, the most informed, at least those who are keeping up with the news, there are deeper things to be informed about in politics and in other matters than keeping up with the news. But those who are most informed about the news and most engaged are in some ways the worst judges, the least reliable judges of people who are not in their group. This is not a good situation for us. Uh, and one of the things that Orwell is suggesting to us is that we ought to, we're, um, people who are very active on one extreme of an ideology or another are not at all likely in our culture to be co-opted by the opposition. But they are often likely to be co-opted by their own group. Co-opted to the extent that the talking points do our thinking for us. Instead of us doing our thinking for us and determining exactly what we want to say, and how we want to say it. There's also something about technology, certainly about the immediacy, both the immediacy and the physical distance, right? It's the immediacy of the reaction and then the physical distance. We're getting to the point in the country where our physical interactions are starting to resemble, our in-person interactions are starting to resemble our online interactions. We should really want it to be the other way around. Right, The way in which we would normally react if someone were sitting across the table from us ought to govern how we would react online. It turns out that the opposite is happening. Right, The way we react online with animosity is starting to infect the way we act in person with others. It's one of the things about technology. Uh, Tolkien, who thought a lot about technology, the First World War really had an impact on him. And everybody was thinking... This new technology that we've got in the modern world is going to help us make progress in every conceivable area. Well, if you lived through the First World War, you didn't think that about technology anymore because civilization had been rent asunder by advanced technology. Tolkien says magic and technology are about the same thing. They're about reducing to the vanishing point the gap between I want it and it appears. So if you have a magic wand, like in Harry Potter, you can use the wand and say Lumos and the light appears. If you have technology, we can walk in here and hit a switch. Right? Technology and magic are both about the, uh, the increasingly immediate satisfaction of desire. We've talked a little bit about, um, in other settings, about Matt Crawford's work, a political scientist, political philosopher at the University of Virginia, who says that spending a lot of time online creates in us the illusion of a frictionless universe, a universe where reality doesn't push back against my will. Right? So if I don't like something online, I simply push and I go somewhere else. Right? Or I say something nasty and then I go somewhere else. Right? It creates the illusion that reality is plastic. Technology does this more broadly, but, but the virtual reality does this even more. Right? Even someone like Freud got certain things quite right, that you move as a child from the pleasure principle to the adult accommodation of the reality principle. Right? What it means to grow up, and this is true for all of our religious traditions as well, what it means to grow up is to accept the fact that the world pushes back against your will, one of the things in growing up. This is sort of a minimum, to accept the reality principle that the world pushes back against your will. That's physical reality, that's conditions you live in, that's other people. But if technology fosters in us 
a view of a frictionless universe that doesn't push back. And then we take that into the world to interact with other people. We're going to think that our will should dominate everything. That there shouldn't be any pushback against our will. Liberal education being led out into freedom. All the great traditions presuppose that we are to ex to some extent born and in a condition of being bound and being blind. This is there in Plato's cave. It's there in every major religious tradition as well. And liberal education is part of the remedy for that. It leads us out of being bound and blind into a greater degree of freedom. But freedom's always difficult. I want to read a passage and then and then uh, wrap up and we can talk a little bit more. There, I mentioned Orwell's become a cliche. One of the things that in 1984 that I think really does help us to understand what's going on in our kind of living in ideological cul-de-sacs is what they call the two-minute hate. And the two-minute hate is a image presentation of political enemies. And the people are gathered together and they're what they do is spend time derisively hissing at the images on the screen. Cable TV is about this, right? I mean, cable news is about getting us riled up in one way or another to have a 60-minute hate. Here's what, uh, here's what Winston says about this. The horrible thing about the two-minute hate was not that one was obliged to act apart, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within 30 seconds, the way the crowd works on you any pretense was unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current turning one after another into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. Liberal education, what Orwell's suggesting about ownership of our language as individuals, is a way of avoiding, at a minimum, becoming a grimacing, screaming lunatic. There are cultural conditions around us now which aim to turn all of us into grimacing, screaming lunatics. One corrective to what I've said so far is Orwell can be taken here as saying you need to learn to think for yourself. And there's certainly something right about that. You do need to take ownership of your, it's your thought, it's your language. And you need to be responsible for it. But you're not going to get very far just thinking for and by yourself. No thinkers whom we regard as great individual thinkers who shaped the course of study, the course of human history, none of them thought simply for and by themselves. They were often heirs of great traditions that they realized once they got into them. And if you're into liberal education, one of the first things you realized is that you are heir to at least one great tradition, maybe many, that you can spend the less rest of your life studying and never master. Right? And the paradox is here that the people who have spent their most time, the most time deeply immersed in a tradition or more than one tradition, end up being remarkably individual thinkers. They end up making their particular stamp. Right? And in fact, if you think about it, the only way you can really talk meaningfully about progress is by reference to a tradition. It's by reference to how far we've gotten up to this point that we can say, okay, we're making progress. Progress, if it is meaningful, can't just mean novelty. It can't just mean doing something different than what we've done before. That means it's got to be gauged by what has been done before. And it's in light of that that we say we're making progress. And the deeper our immersion, the harder we realize it is to make progress. And especially with our own language and our sloppiness and our thinking, it's friends, spouses, friends, family members. These are the ones who call us on these things, right? 
Uh, these are the ones who are willing to be honest with us when we're being dishonest with ourselves. And they're the ones in a community like this, the types of friendships that you can develop where they're helping you to be honest about the most important things and to understand those things more deeply and to come to articulate for yourself how you understand those things. That doesn't mean coming to articulate it in an idiosyncratic way, but you've got to say it. You've got to write it for it to become part of you. It can't just be, even if you've got the, even if you've got the right uh, answers, those need to be more than cliches for us, right? Those need to be things that actually are alive within us and have become part of us. Largely, that's a matter. It's a matter of certain kinds of moral habits and religious habits, but it's also largely a matter of learning to be very careful about how we think, how we read, how we write, and how we speak. These basic, indispensable arts. But it turns out that in order to do this well, you also have to develop the art of friendship. And you have to practice. You have to, you have, to have good friends, good teachers, good colleagues. Being in the right kind of community with the right kind of nourishing support and challenge. Lots of places where you can go where it's sink or swim, you get the great challenge. Other places where they're just going to be patting you on the back all the time. The key is to find the right kind of community which balances deep nourishment and support with deep challenge. And that challenge will enable you to grow into your language and for language to grow into you. So thinking about this nice Orwell piece, I recommend it to you. It's short. Um, uh, if we come back to the larger question, the question of politics, I don't think that any one of us individually taking Orwell's lessons seriously, or even an institution like this or Baylor University where I work, is going to reform our politics, right? And, and, and we're not interested in primarily to reform our politics. We've got bigger things at play, and the reform of politics is going to come out of this indirectly if it comes out of it. Because what we're about is the pursuit of truth in its complexity and its unity. And so our interest in rational disagreement is not merely about being nice to people. It's important, right, to have good manners and to conduct yourself civilly. But it's not merely about civility. For us, rational disagreement is about the fact that I can learn from any serious person that I encounter. Right? And that's important to me because there are always lingering blind spots in my own understanding of material and in my own understanding of the world because my soul is not pure. And so these habits are ultimately about allowing our souls to have increasing access to the truth and to share that with others, both those with whom we agree about deep things and those with whom we don't. Thank you.